Hello and welcome. The topic for today is Newton's method, one of the most important methods in optimization. Before we jump in and discuss what Newton's method is all about, let me take a moment and set the stage for the rest of this lecture. Today, we will focus exclusively on unconstrained optimization. What that means is that we are given a multivariate scalar valued function f, or said differently, we have a function in n variables that takes real values, and we want to minimize this function globally, meaning that we want to find the point x of Rn where f takes the smallest possible value. One thing you can do, of course, is simply plot a graph of the function and eyeball where the minimizer is. It seems pretty easy, right? Well, there are two problems with this approach. First, you can only get so much precision out of a plot like this one. And the second and most important problem is that we cannot really plot functions that depend on more than two variables. In some applications, for example in machine learning, robotics, the functions we are interested in minimizing depend on tens, thousands, sometimes even millions of variables. You can't really plot a function of a million variables. So what can we do in that case? Some of the most useful and most used algorithms belong to the family of iterative optimization algorithms. And Newton method, as we will see, belongs to this family. So the way this works is as follows. You start with some initial guess x0. Usually the closer this initial guess is to the true minimizer, the better. Since the true minimizer is unknown, in practice we just draw this initial condition from some random distribution. Next, we pick a direction, i.e. a vector d0, and we follow it to obtain x1. We can compute f of x1 to track how much progress we have made. Hopefully, f of x1 is smaller than f of x0, meaning that we have descended the value that the graph of the function f traces in space. For this reason, this direction is usually called a distant direction. This family of algorithms is called iterative because this process repeats again and again. At iteration k, I am at some point xk, I pick a vector dk, I follow it, I reach xk plus 1, and I can of course evaluate f at xk and xk plus 1 to see how much progress I have made. The crucial question here of course is that when I am at the point xk, how can I pick the direction dk? This is a crucial question because the way you answer this question determines which algorithm you're using. So let's take a moment to think about what information we can use to pick a good descent direction. When you think about it, we need to understand how the function varies in a neighborhood of xk. This is where multivariate calculus comes in really handy. The gradient of a function, for example, tells us the direction of biggest increase of this function. So it is no surprise that there is an algorithm called gradient descent that picks minus the gradient as a descent direction. Similarly, higher order derivatives can also be useful. The Hessian, for example, contains useful information about the curvature of the function. If this seems a little too abstract at this point, let me be more concrete. Let's consider the following univariate function f. This is simply a polynomial of degree 4. And while we will be working here with one variable for simplicity, everything we will do will generalize to higher dimensions. Let's start by plotting this function to see what it looks like. The minimizer of this function is somewhere here. Let's call it x star. But let's pretend for the moment that we do not know where this minimizer is. Instead, let's try to use some kind of iterative algorithm where I am at some iteration k and I want to design the next descent direction. I have mentioned that the gradient can be useful for that. And in one dimension, the gradient is nothing but the derivative. And the derivative is a limit of this ratio in the right when x tends towards xk. This ratio can be interpreted as the rate of change of the function f around the point xk. If we rearrange the terms a little bit, we see that the derivative is the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f at xk. This means that if we really zoom in around xk, f here in blue and its linear approximation represented by a yellow line 
are pretty much indistinguishable. So here is an idea. Why not minimize the yellow function instead? Minimizing a linear function is the easiest thing in the world. If the slope is positive, we have to go to the left as much as possible. And if the slope is negative, like here, you have to go to the right as much as possible. In both cases, what we're doing is subtracting a positive multiple of the slope or the derivative from our current iterate. Alpha here is called the step size. A linear function is typically unbounded. So you might think that alpha should be as large as possible. But remember, we want to minimize f, not its linear approximation. And far away from xk, the blue and yellow functions might behave in completely different ways. If we take alpha to be too large, we might overshoot and miss the minimizer. And if we take alpha to be too small, then we might take a lot more iterations than is actually needed. Trying to tune this alpha in an optimal way is what leads us to Newton's method. Newton's method is based on the observation that using the second derivative in addition to the first derivative can be helpful. If you remember Taylor's series from your calculus class, we can refine this approximation here by including the second derivative of f to get an even better approximation. The resulting function is no longer linear, but quadratic. And now, the idea is the same. Instead of minimizing the blue function, f, let's minimize this red function, this red quadratic function. And let's pick the minimizer of the quadratic function as our next iterate. For ease of exposition here, I am skipping over some technical details related to the existence and uniqueness of such a minimizer. Anyway, with a little bit of algebra, you realize that this is exactly the same thing as taking alpha to be 1 over the second derivative of f at the point xk. And this is exactly what Newton's method is all about. Note that we do not need to pick the step size alpha manually anymore. When you stare at this expression and figure out all the details, you realize that it generalizes to the case of multivariate functions in exactly the way you would expect it to. You simply replace the first derivative with the gradient, and you replace 1 over the second derivative by the inverse of the Hessian, which is a matrix. If you have seen Newton's method before, it might have looked a little different. Usually, when Newton's method is presented, it is about finding a solution to an equation g of x equals 0. What we have seen today is how to find an x that minimizes a function f of x. As it turns out, these two operations are related. When you minimize a function, what you are looking for are critical points of that function. And a critical point is where the derivative equals 0. So, in order to solve an equation g of x equals 0, you can try to look for a minimizer of the integral of g which leads to the more familiar formula that you see over here. Let us now discuss some good and bad things about Newton's method. Arguably, the biggest pro of Newton's method is its fast convergence. More precisely, when you get close to the minimizer, Newton's method has quadratic convergence. At a high level, what this means is that at every iteration, we double the number of exact digits in our approximation. For instance, take the equation x cubed minus 3 times x equals 0. Square root of 3, or 1.7320, etc., is one of the solutions. If we were to solve this equation with Newton's method, starting at the point x0 equals 2, then the first iteration, we would have two significant digits. At the second iteration, we would have 3. At the third, we would have 6 then 12, then 23, etc. This lecture would not be complete without mentioning some bad properties of Newton's method. Let me mention an important fact before that. Newton's method can be directly applied to find complex zeros, not just real zeros. For example, we could use it to solve this equation, which has three complex roots, which are the cube roots of unity, if I use Newton's method to solve this equation, 
which zero am I going to converge to? Well, that will depend on how I pick the initial point x0. Here, let me color each point of the plane with a different color depending on which zero I converge to if I start from there. When I do that, I get this beautiful fractal-like picture. And as you can see, you can have many points that are arbitrarily close to each other that have different colors, meaning that Newton's method would behave very differently. The sensitivity to the initial point can be problematic at times. Another drawback of Newton's method is its scalability. If you have a function of n variables, you would need n square memory units just to store the Hessian. And to compute the inverse of this Hessian, as is needed by Newton's method, you would need about n cubed operations. This might be fine if you have 10 variables, but if you have, let's say, 10,000 variables, it quickly becomes infeasible. I should mention here that there are some variants of Newton's method, usually called quasi-Newton methods, that somehow avoid computing the Hessian and its inverse, but that's a topic for another day. Thank you very much for listening, and see you next time.